thank you very much. I look forward to working with you on that. Uh, Senator Casey. Chair Murray, thank you for the hearing. And I want to thank you and Senator Markowski and Ranking Member Burr, and of course our witnesses. I want to start with um, Director Goldsby uh, with a question regarding plans of safe care. This is an issue I've worked on for years to support uh, both infants and families affected by substance use disorder. We know that uh, infants and their parents need uh, what I think most would refer to as non-punitive uh, services, uh, as well as treatment and, and support as parents navigate uh, both recovery and, and parenting a young child. But despite longstanding federal law, plans of safe care remain very much underutilized. I appreciate the work of this committee in the uh, CAPTA legislation and authorization over time to address some of the issues that have contributed to these plans of safe care being underutilized. Too many families are slipping through the cracks. And so in particular, I appreciate the, the effort to establish a reporting mechanism when an infant needs a plan of safe care that is separate from the uh, child welfare system. But Director Goldsby, I'd, I'd ask you, what steps can, can we take in Congress, especially here in the Senate, to help states and communities adopt public health-driven approaches to substance use uh, in both uh, pregnancy and as well as to reach more families in need of support? Senator Casey, I'm, I'm glad you asked. You know, I think thanks to the work of this committee and the CAPTA, uh, work that we have underway, we are currently engaged in some in-depth technical assistance with my agency and our South Carolina Social Services Agency as we work hand in hand to develop a plan to address your exact concern. And our plan of safe care work group is focusing on moving intervention services upstream, a more public health uh, approach to support all pregnant individuals who might or may or may not have a substance use issue, but the screening earlier having that universal screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment for everyone earlier in pregnancy and often in pregnancy really minimizes additional prenatal substance exposure. We've decided to call our plan of safe care a family wellness support plan um, because our aim will really be to initiate that prenatal plan sooner and as soon as the mother is identified either with toxicology or the screening so that we're offering a non-punitive supportive set of services across our systems to include mental health and substance use treatment and all the wraparound services. So for some who have severe substance use diagnosis, this plan might include a referral to one of our family care centers, which is our residential treatment centers for women and children that is supported by the, the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant. Um, so that mothers can really stay engaged in services and supported through the delivery of, of their child. Um, and that way, healthcare providers know that they're engaged, know that they're in treatment. And this is all going to lead to more likely results of family remaining unified at the time of delivery so that the mother and the children can continue on in that residential treatment or be discharged home to community based services. But a lot of education has to be done among our healthcare community for them to understand that, like we mentioned, substance use disorder is, is not a moral failing, but is a, a healthcare issue, a disease state, and that people with mental health and substance use issues really shouldn't be further stigmatized but assisted. And I'll just note that all of this work, you know, is supported by our Pregnant and Parenting Women program through SAMHSA, our ESPERT work supported by SAMHSA discretionary grants, and of course, our block grant. Director, thank you for your work, and I appreciate your answer. I wanted to turn to Dr. Princeton. Uh, on page 16 of your testimony, you note that implementation of integrated care, where primary care and behavioral health care providers work as a team, remains unfortunately limited. While there are a lot of models that um, integrate physical and mental health care, many physicians still don't have the ability to seamlessly connect patients to, to a mental health provider. You you mentioned some of the, the barriers, whether it's physical space or IT issues or clinical staffing. What should we do uh, in terms of our focus uh, to help more primary care providers move towards integrated care and how can uh, telehealth support the shift? 
Thank you. Integrated care is, in fact, an excellent way to go. As we just heard before, it's very hard for people to find a health care provider and a mental health care provider. And due to stigma, sometimes even pursuing that in person is difficult. But walking into your physician's office is not attached to stigma. Three things to remember with integrated care. One, it's a lot more than just sticking a mental health care provider into the office of a physician. This is really about the time and the funding that's required for cross-training. So that way physicians and mental health care providers can speak different each other's language, shared records, shared billing processes, these are usually not the traditional one-hour sessions with a mental health care provider. So new billing processes are needed. Two, substantial infrastructure costs are required to successfully integrate be, uh, integrated behavioral care uh, to implement that. So it is uh, important to incentivize physicians to do so. And finally, uh, one-size-fits-all approach is just not going to work with integrated behavioral care. We have evidence that all approaches can be very effective, and primary care providers need to be the folks to decide how best to set it up in a way that meets their needs, their patients, and their community. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Chair Murray. Thank you. Thank you. So